How are you, Melinda? I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing well. So I'm glad to have you here. And I'm going to start off the questions by asking you how you arrived to, in Tucson. Um, well, in the late 50s, my mother uh, remarried and she married a gentleman, my stepfather, who lived here in Arizona. And um, we took a train and got here. And we have been here ever since. We've not moved anywhere else. My uh, stepfather worked for the railroad and my mother was a stay-at-home mom and uh, we felt that this was a real exciting new life you know it was something from Indiana we were in Indiana and that was just so far away and we couldn't believe that we were in this wonderful countryside that had heat you know what we were used to snow so we we uh, have been here ever since and where did you move to when you arrived here? When we arrived here, the first year we were here, we uh, just were kind of mobile. We had a home, you know, a mobile home. And then we moved, my parents saved money to buy a home. And there were some new buildings or new homes being built in the south side. And they found a home in the subdivision of Fiesta Park. And, um, they purchased a home and we moved in in the summer of 1960 to that home. And that was in the Sunnyside School District and we um, attended school from that point on, from junior high, I was in junior high. My two sisters were younger. Um, my younger sister was uh, 10 years younger than I was and so she was not in school yet. I think she was two and then uh, my uh, sister closest to me was just two years younger, so she was a, two years behind me in school. So we grew up, all of us graduated from Sunnyside High School. We went to Sunnyside Junior High, and we were um, really happy. We thought we, you know, we were content. We were in a neighborhood with lots of people, lots of kids. We had a lot of uh, exposure to different kinds of kids, different um, nationalities, different, you know, races. It was, it was really uh, very expanding for me. I mean, my world expanded when we moved here and we thought this was just the perfect place to be. We loved our community. And so um, that's our history as far as what got us here. Mm -hmm. And what did you do? Do you have some of the memories, say, as a young person, either in Sunnyside schools or just like things that you did as a kid in the, in the neighborhood? Oh gosh, we, uh, we had a tether ball in our backyard, so a lot of kids came over to play tether ball. Uh, we, my mother was part of a women's club. They had formed a women's club, and uh, you know they got street lights in the neighborhood. They didn't have any lights, so they were able to, through petitioning, to get street lights. So we played outside under the street lights a lot. We'd play kickball in the street and um, you know swim. Mission Manor pool was not too far. And so during the summer, we were there every day. I mean, I was just always at the pool. We loved it. And so we'd just walk across the park, and there was the pool. And so we did a lot of that. We, at that time, there weren't a lot of organized sports, at least for females. And uh, we didn't do much in that. But we were, um, you know, we ran around a lot and walked to and from school and uh, just went shopping, took the bus downtown where all the stores were at that time. And uh, can you talk to me a little bit about um, basically your school you and high school graduation and how you started your profession? Um, well, we, our school was pretty small, which was one of the things I really liked about it. Now that I look back, especially our uh, graduating class, I think was 284, something like that. And uh, from school, a lot of people were going to away to college or they were going to work. And um, we, the U of A was, my mom and dad had always said that we were going to college, like it or not, so I kind of had to live to, up to that. But um, from there, we, we had a group of about six people from Sunnyside that we connected with, that we would carpool, and we would meet in Louis' lower level and have lunch and talk about, you know, things and how, you know, what was going on in the neighborhood and, you know, who had gotten married, who was having a baby, all of those kinds of things. So we, we stayed connected with this small group of people. And then that slowly would 
change. More people would come in from Sunnyside or we met new friends and did, you know, a lot of, of that. So we made a lot of friends uh, at Louis Lord level. Probably that's kind of a hangout, so maybe that wasn't the best place, but we did, we did love it and we did like having uh, other people from Sunnyside there. It was a small community and we wanted it to stay that way, you know, to stay in touch. And how did you decide uh, to become a teacher? I had always wanted to be a teacher. I don't know why. Uh, it was in me. I used to teach my little sister, the two-year younger one. If I learned something in school, uh, you know, I would teach her on the chalkboard at home when I'd get home, whether it was math or reading. And so I guess it was just a natural thing in me. And she was a very good student, thanks to that. You know, she was she was always ahead of her class, at least by two years, it seemed. But um, that was just what I wanted to do. It was uh, something that I thought would be great, and um, teach other people, teach kids. And so, did you graduate then with a bachelor's in education? I did. I graduated with a BA in uh, education, elementary education, and so then I got a job in. Uh, Sunnyside, and I taught there for, gosh, I'm trying to think it was 14 years perhaps or longer, or maybe longer than that. I should look that up. But um, I taught there and worked on my master's. I did get a master's in educational administration, and there were a lot of uh, friends from the U of A that taught in Sunnyside that, you know, I'm one of my best friends, Edna Figueroa, was. Uh, there and we, you know, we just kept connecting with more and more people, and so um, Lucy Anderson was in Sunnyside with me. She was part of TCE, and you know, she also went to the U of A. So we uh, we managed to keep in touch, and I I love teaching in Sunnyside, teaching kids that I knew their parents, and so it was just so meaningful. I felt like really connected to the children, mm -hmm. not all of them, but most of them. Not that I wasn't connected to all of them, but not all of them were their um, children weren't people that I went to school with. Their parents weren't. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you mentioned to me that you worked in a lot of different types of programs and you're in charge of some of them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can talk about some of the, the proud, the, like I guess some of the programs that you're in charge of that you're proud of. Uh, as Once I, just before I got my master's, I guess, when I decided, uh, the career ladder program was a state program that um, was to get more money in teachers' pockets, basically, that we could do a program and uh, the legislature was only interested in that if we could create something that was going to show that they were doing a better job. And so they had some hoops to jump through is what they used to call them. But we worked really hard to create this program. Other teachers, uh, the um, some administrators also helped on the committee that created our program, the Sunnyside program, and we were funded. And so basically, um, it was one of the few totally teacher-run programs in the state that survived as teacher-run. Uh, we teachers, you know, I left the classroom, uh, another two people left the classroom to manage the program, and then there were teachers hired to evaluate teachers because we had to be sure that the uh, what they were being evaluated for was the same. It couldn't be uh, any kind of, well, I think it's this and you thought it was that, so you know they're not, they're gonna get this score. So those teachers were trained to look at certain things and they evaluated all the teachers in the district who chose to be part of the program. And they, the program brought in initially about two million extra dollars a year of funds that went to funding these positions and also um, funding, giving more teachers more money in their pockets. So it varied anywhere from two to five thousand dollars extra a year, which was really meaningful to most teachers, obviously. And so that increased not only in their yearly income, but it increased in their retirement because the more money they brought in, uh, you know, during their career period, the more money they made in retirement. So it really paid off well. Unfortunately, after about twenty years. The statewide program just recently, a couple of years ago, was counted, canceled because it was expensive. But to you know, to fund teachers who are doing an excellent job, it's not really expensive. It's it pays off in your students and what they're doing. And there, you know, some programs were brought into the into the pro, the 
district because we were able to help fund them through Career Ladder and uh, those funds were real meaningful to us. We brought in a teacher from, actually she was a doctor from Dr. Uh, Maria Montano Harmon from Cal State Fullerton mm -hmm. and she was from Douglas originally and she had proven through her research that there was um, a thing that it did matter uh, if te that kids needed language and it didn't matter if it was in English or Spanish but at some point you know they could learn both languages but it was that they got quality language at the time they were learning it so they needed you know parents who were very verbal so it gave us uh, and that worked with their students and then also uh, and it could be in either language and then when they were in school that that continued that they were constantly learning uh, good language that they were being taught to uh, learn through group activities so that they got to know each other and they weren't, you know, clicking with other group people. They were learning that this is a group that comes together to, um, to get to know each other. Because if you know, you know, I think one of the things she said was that if you know someone, you can't hate them. And so it really improved a lot of what was going on in the district. And she is, was wonderful. She had some really wonderful things to teach us as teachers and, and principals too as staff. So those programs went on for a while. So I was very proud of that too, that the Career Ladder brought those to the district. Mm -hmm. And was this part of a, your union organizing job or after mm -hmm. that did you start working as a teacher? In the I teacher was, union? well, I was active in my uh, teachers union in Sunnyside because every district has a union, has a local. You know, there's a state organization, a national one, and then the local organization was the Sunnyside Education Association. And I began working in that, with that, not, not for pay, but as a volunteer, I began doing organizational work with a lot of other people in the district uh, who were teachers. And we, um, you know, we helped build that local. It was fine as it was, but you have to keep growing and it has to continue. And so we did work at the same time. You don't get paid. It's a volunteer position, but it helps you organize to bargain, to deal with grievances, you know, not in a negative way, but to uh, bring people together to understand why it's important to bargain and to deal with grievances. It, it helps your job. It helps people be more productive. So that was, I did that as a teacher. There's no pay for it. And then I taught uh, and then I did the career ladder for 14 years after I taught 14 years in the career ladder uh, for 12 or 14. And um, I must have been my favorite number because then I was hired by our organization at the state level, the Arizona Education Association, to be what we call an organizational consultant. And you not only organize things at the state level, but you go into locals like Sunnyside or Nogales or you know, these other locals, and you help those leaders organize to bargain, to you train, you do all kinds of things to, um, to make them successful or to help them be successful. And so it seems that after kind of all of this, the, you mm -hmm. obtained all these different skills, the education mm -hmm. that you had, uh, then you started kind of becoming uh, involved in other community things. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you become involved in the contamination issue or when did you hear about the contamination issue? It, it, yeah, it's a long story because that also kind of overlaps all the other things because in the, we, we li still lived in the community, my husband and I, and we had our first baby when uh, we were living in the community and I would walk to Santa Clara Elementary where I was uh, teaching. And so um, before that even after, about high school time when we got out and we were still going to baby showers and checking in with people, we started hearing about a lot of our friends and people and their family members who were sick. They were coming up with terrible diseases and cancer and neurological problems and a lot of um, you know, things that you hear about, but not so many in the community all at one time, the same community, and starting with younger people, there were heart conditions, um, baby, you know, babies that were having heart conditions that they attributed to the contamination. And, um, you know, so there was just a lot going on that 
I, I started by keeping a list of people that I knew in the community because I just finally got, I said, I have, somebody's got to keep track of this. So I started compiling a list of people that I knew who were ill, their family members were ill, they'd gotten cancer, they had come down with lupus, my sister has lupus, um, lots of you know, other kinds of diseases. And that was one of the things the um, establishment used against us because they said, well, there can't be anything wrong with the water because uh, these aren't just cancer people, they have all kinds of things wrong with them. And we said, but the thing is, they're all sick and they're things that you might not normally get. And later we found out that it's true with the TCE, it, it actually uh, makes you ill and it can make you get something that you might have gotten anyway when you were 80, but now you're getting it at 18. You know, so, so in the research that went on over time, we realized that that was explained. And so, but you know, we were able to make headway even in spite of that initially when they were trying to say that that wasn't, uh, you know, you proved it wasn't really TCE. So, and I'm sorry, did you have more to that question? No, uh, okay. That's great. And then um, I guess, you started kind of seeing this in, it seems like in, fam in family members, mm -hmm. neighbors, you started yes. going to these parties and seeing that yes. friends had this. Mm -hmm. And when do you remember actually hearing the news about the contamination? I believe it was 1982 when Jane Kay's articles came out. And I remember, because we had talked about it so much and among my friends and people that we were uh, close with. and. When I saw the paper, and I just saw it, and I said, "This is it. This is, you know, I'm sorry." No, that's fine. I said, "This has to be it. This is what's happened to all of us, and to all of our family members and friends that are ill." And so, uh, from there, we started organizing. And Eduardo, you know, we started a group. But before that, a few of us got together and said, "What, you know, what can we do?" And we scheduled the Valencia Library to hold a meeting, you know, and we put the word out that we would be meeting to talk about all the illnesses in the community and, uh, you know, what had caused them perhaps, and that we were going to start a group to try to get to the bottom of it and see what we could do. So, you know, there was a neighborhood group, uh, the Sunnyside Neighborhood Association. We notified them. We tried to notify any, you know, the teachers union. There were people there. I went there initially representing them. And we tried to get, um, you know, as many people notified as possible because you'd be surprised. Nobody knew anything that people, they thought, oh, people are sick. Well, they just thought, you know, their mother died at 40, you know, of breast cancer. I mean, that's not normal. I mean, it really isn't. And uh, even in those days, and, you know, there's, they just thought, well, as some of them told us, that's God's will. And no, we're not going to be organizing for anything, you know, and we just kept at it. We just kept contacting people. And so we had this first meeting, and I believe it's on tape somewhere. Um, so uh, on one of the tapes I have, there's a little piece of it I know that you'll see. Um, but um, we, you know, we just started meeting, and we had this big meeting at, at uh, Valencia Library. And um, Eduardo came, and he was there, and there were, and uh, Lynn Prouty was a teacher at Sunnyside High School. She came. My sister came. She was an elementary teacher, and a lot of members of the association uh, came, and, you know, I could name them all, but it wouldn't do any, you know, any good. But it, uh, but Eduardo and I kind of took over the meeting. We just had called it, and he had caught wind, I think, of it, or I had caught wind of a flyer he'd put out. I don't really remember now which way it was, but however it was, we had this joint meeting, and uh, from there, we began organizing around the problem. And we kept notifying people and calling people and, you know, surveying the neighborhood. We'd walk up and down streets and ask if people in their family had had any kind of illnesses, you know, their kids, any illnesses. And uh, because we realized, we didn't realize then, but we realize now that those who were exposed younger were the ones who had the most problems. They got the most illnesses. So someone like me, I was fortunate that I moved to the neighborhood and at junior high level, and I've had many problems throughout my life, lots of illnesses, 
lots of things that normally wouldn't, all of them wouldn't happen maybe to one person, but fortunately they've not been deadly yet. And I know that that's eventual, you know, it'll probably be the case. But um, we, we knew that something was wrong and that we had to make a difference for the community. So we just, from that meeting, we set a new date and we just kept spreading the word to local community organizations, to other groups who had noticed in the past, like, and that's where uh, some of the, uh, Mirna, I think her name was, and uh, the person who took over TCE eventually, I can't remember her name right now, but she, uh, when all the rest of us had moved on to continue doing other things, but not, not forgetting it by any means, but we just no longer had the time to be doing the community meetings. And by then, the word had gotten out and the, the paper articles. And then uh, we were interviewed quite a bit for the paper and what was happening. And uh, Jane Kay was a great help to us. I mean, I just, um, and then Lois Gibbs, I believe, from the New York um, Island. And again, I'm sorry, I'm drawing blanks here on some of these names, but we connected with everybody. How did you start organizing? What did you need to do? We received a lot of pushback, a lot of people uh, and businesses, you know, they thought, you know, a lot of people who worked for uh, Hughes Aircraft at the time thought that we were gonna try and get rid of their jobs because we were gonna get rid of Hughes Aircraft and that that was our goal. And that was not the goal. The goal was to find out what happened, try to fix it if we could and to keep it from continuing and to keep it from, you know, we weren't only those two that I mentioned were we even aware that there were people who were fighting this kind of contamination, you know, the the New York. And then now, since then, there's been hundreds, you know, we now are aware that TCE has been everywhere. And so kind of where it is, we just kept going from there. Mm -hmm. So that's, I, I, I enjoy that story of how you met Eduardo and yeah. all of that. <laughs> yeah. It seems like it was a perfect. It, it was, it was, we were both organizers of our unions kind of, and bossy you know <laughs> and we're used that you know we're gonna organize this and this is the way we're gonna do it but we'll take input and we did i mean everybody we got everyone agreed at where we were headed and the things that we did in our own little studies with the the surveys that we went out to the neighborhood and then the pins you know on the board as we found people who were now being diagnosed with serious illnesses and we marked the streets and where and we did find from those uh, just found a lot of things from that but the clusters near the wells, you know, people, you know, were most ill if their homes were near the wells that were closed. So. Wow. And then how, so is this how in um, Tucsonans for a Clean Environment was established? Yes. Yes. We, um, we all came together. And if, even if people were working independently a little bit at that time, we just joined forces and we started uh, Tucsonans for a Clean Environment. And we, uh, from there, we just, we let the public know, we let the media know when we were meeting and that we needed more people to come forward to talk about their illnesses that, you know, we were trying at that time, early on we were trying to say, okay, is it just cancer or is it just neurological issues or is it, because there's epilepsy issues and their heart problems with the babies and, you know, we had all this input we were gathering and so, that's why we did the pen thing and uh, we identified what their illnesses were. But um, yeah, so there, Tucsonans for a Clean Environment was born and we just moved on and we had a strong group of people from the community and, um, it, and from, you know, I was, still, I was still in the community at the time, but later moved. I can be honest to tell you that it scared me to death. I mean, I was had my first child and I, you know, we were feeding her this poisonous water. I was drinking it, you know, I, and we were not too far from a major well and we moved. We just, I just couldn't do it. I just had to get out of there as a lot of people tried. The sad thing is that it impacted their home values and people couldn't sell. You know, they would try to move at that time as the plume was moving under our community. It was moving further north and uh, around into the east side some and north. And uh, for a long time, they were having difficulty selling their their homes. I think once the wells were cleaned, you know, they you know the plume was treated, I guess, or moved on, and then there were other people with problems too. But uh, people felt more safe to come back into the community, or. They
they sold their homes or they chose to stay. But now they've proven the well water is healthy and that so it isn't a need to move right away or, you know, I just, I still don't drink tap water. And I know it's perfectly fine. It's, it's in me. You know, I just can't let that go. Mm-hmm. So I, it's hard. Yeah, and I understand that. I think in Nogales, where I'm from, mm-hmm. it's the same thing. We all have um, bottled water, mm-hmm. things of that mm-hmm. sort. So it's very common. <laughs> right. And what was your initial role uh, in Tucsonans for a Clean Environment? Gosh, I don't even know. I think I was probably the chairperson. I think Eduardo and I kind of took turns at being the, I don't know if we didn't call them the president or if we call them just the the organizer or the chairperson. I'm not sure, but initially I think I was or Eduardo was, but whatever, we kind of went back and forth. And then other people started taking those positions and, and leading the group. And, you know, we were there in support. And uh, so that's kind of that's what I think it was. But we did, because we had background in, in organizing. I didn't even realize that it was so valuable at that time, but now I know how valuable organizing is and learned from that. It's incredible what we were able to accomplish. And do you remember um, if it was just strictly community members or if you had um, like not other nonprofits mm-hmm. come, government, or who was mostly involved? It was uh, community members, I'd say was the highest number, then teachers probably in the, the community because they were teaching in the district. They were also being exposed all these years. And because they were members of the organization, uh, the union, they came forward. We had a lot of people from within the district, uh, but they also had lived in the district or they still did maybe. Um, But we did, I would say initially, and the people who carried it forward um, after the first five or 10 years or so were community members. Um, But you couldn't get rid of us. Eduardo and I were there to stay, you know. I don't think they tried, but you know, it was like, okay. So we hung around the longest, I think, but we had a lot of really great community members that just dug in and said, they can't do this to us, you know, we're gonna fight. And so, um, you know, Marie Sosa, you know, stands out in my mind. Um, I shouldn't do this. I should have read through the list because I, my memory for names is not the best anymore. And so, but the older gentleman, Sal, I think his name was, and oh my gosh, um, you know, we had Lynn and, and Lucy and Dee and uh, all kinds of people, you know, we just, there were so many that were helpful. Eduardo's going to have better memory on that, I think. Is there any specific uh, activities that you remember or things that you did as Tucsonans for a Clean Environment that you could say this was one of our goals we accomplished? Well, I think the most important one, truthfully, was getting the word out. And we did have, one of our first goals was getting the information out to people. So even though it was in the newspaper, it was shocking, like I said earlier, how many people didn't know. And so we went to community groups when we needed to. We tried to get uh, you know, we tried to do the surveys. Those were the those were the times we called in speakers. We had continued to have monthly meetings, sometimes more often, and we would have speakers come in. Uh, we called the health department in Tucson, which there were some very difficult meetings that we had with the lady in charge of that. I wish I, I don't think I'd ever forget her name, but she was very disliked in the community because she had made many comments. Uh, that were were disparaging against the Hispanic community, Uh, you know, that they don't eat right, they don't eat healthy, they're, you know, they don't see doctors like they should. You know, there were, it was blaming the person because she refused to admit that there were any, there was anything wrong with the water. So we had anybody, time we could get a speaker, we did bring Lois Gibbs from New York to speak to our group. We, um, gosh, we, we did a lot just in communicating. That was our number one goal, to, to grow the group so that we had more worker bees, kind of, and to uh, just keep that moving. Because if the community didn't know, and then even if they did know, if they weren't kept involved, because you need to have organizing to go on to keep people involved, that that would be a problem. So we that was one of the things. We also made the T-shirts that so that when we wore them, people saw them. We put signs in... Um, to Zonas for a Clean Environment, advertised our meetings, like in grocery store windows in those days, you could do that. We, uh, you know, we made phone calls. We did, 
all kinds of stuff. So um, I, I'm I'm proud of everything that we did. It was it was so unlikely that it would ever be successful, uh, and it was. It was highly successful. Uh, you know, after a time, we did find that we weren't powerful enough even then. Um, we needed to exist because anybody trying to do anything beyond that would have had needed this group to to move forward. But uh, we did have by that time um, the lawsuit came along, and um, you know even though we didn't create that, we did uh, search one of our members. You know, my ex-husband now, but at the time he was my husband. He had been in law school when this first came out, and he was could not. He was too busy to even. He didn't attend even many of our meetings, but. Over time, we realized that to get the things done we needed, we were going to need money. We were going to need somebody who was important enough or wealthy enough to take on these big companies that we had been facing all this time who were still denying it. And, and so uh, we thought about uh, you know, a lawsuit. And um, he was not, he was newly in practice and he couldn't afford to take it on. So he found a company in Texas, the Baron and Bud Company, that uh, that's what they do for a living. They constantly are doing these kinds of lawsuits over contamination. And so they came and started meeting with us. And I think they took the group to a higher level, not higher meaning it was better, but the next step that we needed to take in order to get attention and to make people realize that we were, um, you know, that we were doing something that the community needed to be involved in, and whatever they were going to do to fix it, we needed to have a say in that. And so that's what the lawsuit provided for us. It gave us more attention. It, they had the funds. They came into town and they started doing health tests and surveys, and um, you know, it gave us attention. And because they had had past cases like this or similar it made uh, people listen. I mean, it was like, okay, now you're not just making something up. We now know that there have been other cases that we just didn't know about where there was contamination, whether it was California or New York or wherever, um, that now there is a reason to, there is, it's true. People for, not many, but some would just, you know, you're wasting your time, you know, kind of stuff. So uh, that was very helpful to us because they, they had the money to, and the numbers of staff to do the things that needed to be done to take us to the next step in this. So they couldn't just dismiss us. And that's when a lot started happening. Because if nothing else, they were trying to prove that it didn't happen so that, you know, in the same time we were showing that it did. <laughs> so it was, you know, they found that and they couldn't ignore it. There were people who were now looking at it. And so that's... That's kind of, but it is, I must tell you, it was the thing I was the most proud of that I ever accomplished. And it wasn't me alone, I'm not saying that, because there were so many people, I just admire them all so much for coming forward to help. And then I want to come back to the mm. lawsuit, but before that, I want to ask mm. you, how long were you involved with Tucsonans for a clean environment? Gosh, a long time. I would say, you know, I really don't know. It seemed like forever, but I think it was probably eight to 10 years. I mean, I, and I still consider myself a member, even though it's not active or not, I don't, you know, there are other groups now forming to do other things that are similar, which I'm glad to hear that they're being successful in, in organizing people. Um, it was a long time. I can, I can remember it was, it was hard because we were all so busy as well, but this had to take a priority. So everybody, sadly, your families kind of took a back seat because you were so busy doing this. It was just too important to let go. So ask Eduardo, he may know, or you've already talked to him, maybe he said, but it was a long time. And then how was the community incorporated into the process of Tucsonans for a Clean Environment? Like you mentioned that you would mm -hmm. put uh, in the grocery store advertisements. Mm -hmm. As new people came in, mm -hmm. how, how would, did you work with them? Well, they just became, as they came and signed in, they became members, okay? So they, and we did, you know, like I said, a lot of uh, these meetings were on TV, on the news and stuff like that. So as people came within the community, we 
work to see if they had a skill that was going to be important for the organizing for the Tucsonans for a Clean Environment, whether they could uh, put out a newsletter, for, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, could they walk up and down neighborhoods to get more information? Uh, could they invite their families to these meetings so that more people were involved? And so they, you know, there was always a job to be done and uh, most of them were real willing to start working. So that's how we incorporated them because at that time, um, you know, that was, those were the things that needed to be done. And then is there um, something about your role in Tucsonans for a Clean Environment that might not be well known or that you want uh, people to remember? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure how well, it depends on what, how you define well known. I mean, I'm still getting think calls from all over the place, you know, and, and tapes that are being sent to me and people, I guess you might describe that as well known. but. Uh, no, the main thing I want people to know is that we there was a need and we came forward and we did the best we could to deal with it and to help families recover sometimes their health or their their you know their um, their lives basically. So, but that's it wasn't for anything personal. It was for my kids, for my kids. And then you mentioned um, the lawsuit uh, that occurred, uh, that Baron and Bud was mm -hmm. the head of it. And then you also mentioned that they were putting together different health tests mm -hmm. uh, that occurred in the community in order to find out if there was an issue or not. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about uh, some of these tests or some of the activities that they did? Well, they did all kinds of tests. I mean, they did neurological testing, they took x-rays, they did IQ tests, and uh, they did, I mean, anything you can think of that might show. And they did find results that uh, helped them identify the first eight or 10 people that were named in the lawsuit. And so they, and I don't know if it was those, I don't think it was those tests alone, but considering the illnesses and what had happened and what had taken place, there were certain people who were named um, as plaintiffs in the not lawsuit. And then there were, I think, about close to 2,000 plaintiffs total, but they're not all named. That's why it was a class action suit. So um, I, other than that, I don't know. They did find things, though, I know that. And then um, from there it went. They, they continued to follow people's health. They, you know, obviously got, collected files on everyone who came forward as to things that were wrong with them and when it started and you know where they lived exactly and I know that um, other groups have formed from time to time that kind of carried that on I believe of bringing people forward but I don't know now that that suit has been closed for a long time because they had to finally okay these are the 1200 people or 1600 people that we have now that will be named you know to go forward but they had everyone that came forward at that time. Mm -hmm. And we tried to advertise. That was another thing. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, the meetings also helped that, but we tried to advertise you know, to people that there is a lawsuit. You know, come forward and let's see if you, you know, if you have a story, if you have somebody you love that has passed away or this ill, you, you know, there because we have two close friends that are, um, have, well, I'm trying to say how, they were, we had a person who died very young, like 17, the first person who died of cancer in the community. And of course, everybody knew because she had been in our school. It was a very sad situation. And then uh, from that time on, we had more people who, um, who became sick. And I'm trying to think, you know, the point I'm trying to make, but it was, it was, um, ask me your question again one more time, just, I'm sorry, just, it's too, too much going through my head right now, but. No, that's fine. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just wondering some of the tests that were uh, provided in the community and kind of some of these. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. These, uh, I guess, some of the things that were mm -hmm. discovered by the mm -hmm. lawsuit. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I know that they could tell it was some of the mental tests, some of them, their memory was impacted. And so that was, you know, you took a test initially and you had to remember, then they would question you. They, they did them some individually, some were done 
by computer. So I do know they were looking at, for cancers, they were looking for mental uh, issues because a lot of people uh, were more likely to have epilepsy. They were, and I know that's not always a mental condition. I'm, I don't, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not trying to define anything. But there were, uh, amazingly, and I can't, but you know, there are other people, people who were involved with the, the lawsuit more that could probably give you accurate answers on that. But I do know there were some. So that's, I, I remember taking the test. So I'm going back to what, you know, I, I took and, and um, lots of, of mental kinds of questioning and have your memory, has your memory been infected? And mm -hmm. how can we tell there's damage? And how many people, you know, like my, uh, the lawsuit, my ex-husband, his family, many of them have, or there's been epilepsy in the older people, like when they got in their 40s or so. Also, um, neurological, lots of neurological damage. So there's, and these tests somehow, I never quite understood it myself and probably never had time to ask. So, but that's about all I know on that. Okay, so that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I, one of my last questions regarding mm -hmm. the lawsuit, if, if you remember if there was any money set aside for health purposes or did that mm -hmm. help fund, um, I think it was called the TC Clinic. Mm -hmm. if you At know the El Pueblo Neighborhood Center, yes, there was. And I don't know exactly how much or if it was you know, put in a trust to continue the funding. I believe it was something like that. And um, people were able to go and receive health care there and continue, you know, with kinds of treatments that they offered. Um, I never needed to go there at that time, so I, I've not experienced that personally. But yes, there was money set aside for that. And then uh, thinking back on your experience and your work um, at the Superfund site and mm -hmm. with the contamination and Tucsonans for a Clean Environment, what would you like to see future generations learn from this experience? Not to take everything for granted. I never in a million years thought that I'd need to worry about the water being clean. I never in a million years thought that there would be someone at a company that would um, not be concerned that they might be killing people by just dumping into the groundwater because we know they knew. Part of the lawsuit found that out and uh, we know that they knew. And I don't understand how people do that. So don't take anything for granted. Be active in your community. Make sure that you're spending the time you need to protect yourself and your family. So, sorry. No, that's fine. And I think that this is, uh, your story is very valuable, right, for these future generations too, to see how you organized in the community to put together such a strong effort that was grassroots. So then if something does come about or those generations right. that are in charge, you know, after everybody, mm -hmm. you know, changes generations down there, they'll be able to see your mm -hmm. example. So that's really great. And um, how would you like the memory of your work or your experience to be remembered in the community? Gosh, I haven't thought of anything like these things, so these questions, but um, that, that I just, when I saw a need, I stepped up and did it. I worked with other people, I found people, you know, Eduardo and I drug people into these things to start out and, um, that, uh, you know, I, I, I did what needed to be do, done. I wasn't going to stand back and, because I guess I thought we were all invincible and if we were going to make, you know, trouble and they were going to have to clean this up if it was the last thing we did. And basically that's what we attempted to do. So I guess hopefully it's a lesson that anyone can step up. I never thought as a very shy young woman that I would be able to do something like this. And, um, you know, I, I think that's the way I'd like to be remembered if for that or for any other thing that I've done. And then how do you think that the memory of the Superfund site and the contamination should be remembered? Gosh, 
I don't know. It's a very, it's a, a very sad thing, and I, I don't know how it should be remembered. I, I think that. I'd like to think that it's partially cleaned up, but as we know now, there are new things they're finding because we have new technology out, and uh, it's already in the groundwater. And um, I just want it to be to be remembered as a community that stepped forward, and that. And it was an unlikely community. It wasn't a community that made waves. It was a community that, you know, was happy and healthy and, you know, close, a close-knit community with, you know, we had all mixes of people, races, ethnicities, and um, it was, I don't know, I think other than that, you just have to know that the community did something about it. They were successful to some extent, and uh, hopefully they're going to continue to being successful because we're all going to have to be on guard here. We're going to have to watch what's happening. And then did you ever receive information, like technical information, about the hydrology or the health of the area? Mm -hmm. um, and if you did, I imagine you had to review a lot of these materials that were mm -hmm. even put out by the responsible parties. Right. right? And mm -hmm. how... I guess what format and or did you have to self teach yourself a lot of the stuff and then it was there some formats that you thought oh this is easier for me to understand but how did that work like um well i i think that obviously we had to teach ourselves we had and that's what helped when we reached out to other groups and other states that we now these sites that were ahead of us and that's some of the information that we received from them and was to, to, this is what you're looking for and you need to keep pushing until they test in a certain way or until they're actually doing what you need to have done. And so that's about the best answer I can give to that. I know that um, nowadays we're finding them everywhere and I, I just think that we're going to have to come up with some way to stop dumping. The companies are going to have to be held accountable much and to strict standards and we're finding that that's not even happening now you know and, and we're aware that it's killing people. Eventually it's getting to all of us and we just have to we're going to have to uh, be more vigilant. And then um, I think you've mentioned this before but I'm going to ask you did mm -hmm. the Superfund site change your behavior when it comes to contamination in your community or even in your household? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I recycle. I make sure that, um, you know, that we're, we're drinking at least clean water, you know, and um, we, I'm much more sensitive to the trash I, I send. You know, I make sure that I'm, if, if it's supposed to be paint and you put it in a certain place you, or collect the batteries separately, you do things to keep the the earth from becoming more contaminated because we know that a lot of the dumps that we have are very contaminated and people are they're building homes on them you know and all around them and so you know I think that we're going to have to be very vigilant and I try to do that I try to make sure that we're not further contaminating um, you know our our land and hopefully everybody's doing that in our oceans. I mean, it worries me. And I do try to, and I, my sister does, and all, you know, people that we know, we're always on them, make sure, you know, you're doing this or that, it's important. It may seem like a little piece, but every little bit helps. So that's just, yes, I'm, I, and I still get upset when I find out now that plastics can't be put in dishwashers, you know, and these are mostly kids, food dishes that you give, you know, and the food comes in them and there are all these plastics that, so anyway, it, it never ends it seems, but you just have to be vigilant. Mm -hmm. And then what advice do you have for state and federal personnel that are overseeing the cleanup today, like from your experience and mm -hmm. your wisdom that you have? Well, I guess I can only, um, hope and, and believe that they're doing the best they can. Um, you know, I am saddened by things that I hear, you know, when new things come along that we're being exposed to or when 
TCEs being cleaned out of the water and put into the air for the same people to breathe. That's very discouraging. Um, but I mean, I hope that people are being hired to fill these positions that know what they're doing and care as much about the community and our environment as the people living in it do. I mean, they it has to impact them as well. And so I'm not sure how to, I do I, I don't know if you're asking, do I always trust? No, I've learned not to trust. And, um, you know, I know there are people I may think are more trustworthy when it comes to this stuff, but no, I, I'm sorry, it's part of me is dead, you know, when it comes to believing that um, we can trust anyone else to, if we're not right there on top of it, it's just not going to happen. And um, what additional information would you like to have or have had regarding the site in terms like, for example, when you were learning or you learned about us, the site, what information do you wish you would have had in hindsight? Well, I wish I would have been able, had someone who would have brought to us the facts of the case because a lot of times uh, we had a lot of people who were doubters and you know, it's, and I know part of it was big business behind it, you know, but if we had had at our disposal some way to get the actual results of tests that had already been done in other places, or, uh, you know, the, somebody with expertise that we could call on that was set in place. I don't know if like it's the EPA or, you know, I know they did help some, but not as much as we would have liked. You know, we had a lot of disappointments in, in people early on, but um, I guess that's the only thing I can say. You're just going to, it would have been helpful for us to have people that we could turn to, but that just wasn't the case then. Mm -hmm. And then I'm curious, this question I'm just thinking right mm -hmm. now, is did you ever collaborate with the University of Arizona researchers from here? We did on uh, the heart situation with the babies. We, the University of Arizona uh, moved in and did that. And I don't know how they got involved or how they, if, you know, just they were noticing it themselves or if it was connected, but it was connected somehow to that Superfund site and to the, my, one of my uh, sister's daughter was one of those children that had uh, heart problems. Her, you know, her heart was, it wasn't normal the way it should be, but she's still alive and living and doing well. So we're, you know, She's tiny, but you know, brilliant, and has a, you know, a college degree, and she's happy, happily married. So yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you'd like to comment on? Maybe something that I forgot to ask you, or that you realize that you want to say, or anything of that sort. Gosh, I don't know. Uh, the only thing I'll mention, also, and I may have mentioned to this you, this before a lot. In our, we just had uh, two years ago now, almost two years ago, well, it is two years ago this October, we had our uh, 50th high school graduation reunion. And part of that reunion, because uh, there were a lot of us connected to this lawsuit who were organizing for the reunion again, and uh, who, who took part in it or were plaintiffs in the case. and. Uh, so what we did is that we put aside uh, the money that we charge people for the reunion, you know, for the dinner and everything. We budgeted enough money to put aside to make a contribution, that our contribution back to Sunnyside, the district and to the high school. Uh, we There's a program there that is so inspiring uh, with Sunnyside students who are just thriving and doing beautifully and going to taking university getting university credit while in high school and um, so that program we earned that money we gave to them so that more students could get college credit they obviously all took the same course and they had the same test to pass and everything but only those who had the money could get the college credit because they had to pay for the units and a lot of kids were going through and not able to do it. So we raised about $8,000 to put toward that program to pay for uh, part of, you know, part of our fee to go to the reunion to um, get college credit. So they, and hopefully we'll be able to somehow continue that. Now I don't know if any of the future classes have chosen to do that, but we thought uh, what better way to, you know, 
to reward students for a job well done and for hard work. You know, so that's that is one of the things that can be done still to help the community and and students get more more college graduates mm -hmm. out of the community. Mm -hmm. And that's very generous, right? Because as we all know, yes. the cost of university oh, uh, fees yes. are increasing. Yes. So that's very generous to provide that, mm -hmm. especially to high school students yes. that are achieving that. Yes, that program is so impressive. I, I can't remember the exact name of the program, uh, but it is very impressive. And it's quite well known there in the district. So you, anyone who wanted it could find out about it. And um, they're, you know, so we had them participating in our reunion where we gave them, you know, the $5,000 check that one of our members, Linda Moore, got from Barron and Bud in, in Dallas. The attorneys that worked with it, they donated 5000 And then we, from our extra money from the reunion, we had another, I think it was three or four more thousand, something like that. So. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you want to first talk about the t-shirt image and like I mentioned, why you selected this image, what it means to you, and what do you want uh, other people to learn from it? Well, the t-shirt the image was, we wanted, we wanted to be visible. And because we were trying to spread the word of the organization, we thought people wearing t-shirts around the community might attract attention. And then, you know, if we're at meetings and we're wearing the t-shirts, and then it also, uh, would, we didn't really charge much for them, but I'm sure we probably used those funds also to help put out our newsletters and things like that. But the uh, the image, I don't know, it just means a lot to me. And I know I kept my t-shirt even to this day. And oh my gosh, I, I never even realized it so much until the last few years as I would run into it again and I would think, oh, I just have to take real good care of this because it, it's just a visual of what we were Doing. And I think it's a way of communicating with people. It's something that gives you meaning in your life as well. I mean, that I've kept this t-shirt, like I said, that is this big, you know, <laughs> it doesn't fit me anymore, but it's still, it's still mine and it's still there. And I'll probably frame it uh, just so I can see it every day and hang it in my home office, you know, but I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but that's, it is, it, it, um, it meant a lot then and it means a lot now. And then I don't know if you just want to talk then now a little bit about mm -hmm. the VHS tapes and what were some of the what were some of the recordings that are in there. Uh, we recorded meetings, so we would have meetings, and whether it was just the group, because uh, we did have some just committee meetings, obviously, uh, we would have potlucks at one another's homes where we would have meetings, and so there were some pictures from that. We also. Uh, we tried to be visible, you know, at certain, you know, the Tucson Water meetings downtown and things like that. Most of them, we had the community meetings that we had, um, we would, and the stations would come and take pictures of our meetings while that was going on. And those, a lot of the VHS tapes included those, you know, because somebody else would be taking it as well, or they'd be taping it at home if the station took it, you know, and we would, um, so they were, they were important and they did help us spread the word, basically, get the word out there. Because without, um, you know, a lot of money in this group, we, we had to think of ways to be seen and to be known and, and to let people know we were there. And that was, they're always, the picture, a picture is always worth a thousand words, you know. And so, and a lot of the, the community members, they would appear on TV, you know, and, and people would see them and they know them, they're, hey, that's my neighbor down the street. And then they would become more interested. Sadly, a lot of these people also are gone, you know, so we're, um, you know, we're not with, they're not with us now, but I hope you've been able to find enough people to, to accomplish your goal. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they, I've it's been great interviewing you. So I I've actually have been really excited to talk to you, especially when I learned of your involvement with schools. Also, mm -hmm. so thank you so much. These are all the questions that I have. Okay. But thank you very much for um, being able to be interviewed, and um, I'll be in contact then when right. I process all the interview, so you can review it and see how it looks. Okay, great. Uh -huh. Well, thank you for asking me. I, you know, had to reach back in my brain and say, oh, okay, I'm going to have to remember some things. But 
thank you very much. It's, I think it's still a very important issue. So. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.